morning, everyone. Morning. Morning, morning, morning. Would you stand with us? How is everybody? Awesome, awesome. Today's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Would you agree? Yes. Come on, say amen. Give me a hand clap right here. Come on. Let's wake up a little bit. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. Yes. He is faithful. We come into this house to worship. Amen.
him a hand clap of praise this morning. He's an awesome God. Amen. Amen.
say that he is good. Lord, we bless you today. Lord, today I don't bless you because of what you've done for me, but I bless you because of who you are today, God. We bless you today, Jesus. When the world looks so bad around us, God, you're so faithful. You are our rock, our firm foundation, God, that we stand on this morning. And no weapon formed against us today, God, shall ever prosper. We bless you today.
as the gospel but really don't have anything to do with with the word right there's there's Santa Claus Jesus there's Jenny in a bottle Jesus there's God on a leash Jesus where you get him to do everything you want him to do in your time and you've we've created a God in our own image and we named him Jesus and it's got nothing to do with how he revealed himself in the word so if if today is not getting a blessing is Jesus enough? Is being in His presence enough? Is the promise that He'll never leave us and never forsake us, is that enough? If the request that you bring to the throne of grace, He says no to, is Jesus still enough? Paul Paul the Apostle Paul that wrote a third of the New Testament said here's my resume and I'm a kind of a big deal but none of that makes any difference because what I want is to know Jesus and to know him in the power of the resurrection and everybody goes yes we want to know him in the power of the resurrection and then he says and in the fellowship of his sufferings 
And we go, no, that's not what we signed up for. But you can't know Jesus and not walk through all of those things because that's, that's who He is and that's what He calls us to. Is Jesus enough? If everything goes sideways tomorrow, but you've still got Jesus, is He enough? Is He enough? So Lord, we're not in a hurry today, and we've just sort of lingered here in Your presence. And Lord, we just, we just check in our hearts right now, Lord. We're just checking our hearts. Lord, we want to make sure that we can say with the Apostle Paul, I just want to know you. The fellowship of your sufferings, the power of your resurrection, any way, any path, whatever it is that you've got for us, God. In the best days, in the worst days, in the times when it feels like our prayer life is brass heavens, and in the times where it seems like we're sitting in your lap with your arms wrapped around us, no matter what it is, God, we, we choose you. And we declare today that you're enough. You're enough. You're enough for us. You're enough. So we just thank you and praise you. We do say thank you for all of the blessings that you gave us. Not because we're good, but because you're good. So we thank you for those. But Lord, more importantly, we thank you for who you are. Not just the blessing, but that you're the blesser. And we just say thank you for everything. And we are grateful that we get to be in your presence. And that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we will get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's enough. Thank you for leading us into His presence today. July went. Um, it happened fast. It feels like a month since we've been in, since I've been here with y'all. If y'all have been here the last two or three weeks, yes, the pastor does attend church here occasionally. Um, so I took a, I took a, a, a week off in, uh, on the 10th to just try to rest and, and, and recuperate a little bit. And then I was sick, so it didn't really work. Um, then the next, the next week I was at Bremen City Church. They asked me to come and share the message of of um, heart attacks and bring some books over there for, for their congregation. So I did that and people have been asking me how it went. It went really well. They're very gracious, a great congregation, sweet people. And, uh, and, and many of them, I think, received the message, um, took it personally and, and are pursuing healing. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Last week we were on the ball fields. Last week this time, y'all, we were losing weight. We were melting in our tennis shoes. Uh, those that were there last week, thanks for coming. I hope y'all had a good time. I had a great time. Yes, it was hot, but it's July also. There you go. It was hot, but we had a great time out on the ball fields in, um, at Bremen Rec Department proclaiming the, the glories of the Lord and uh, sharing a little time in the Word and, and a whole lot of time in fellowship. And it was just great. I appreciate y'all being there. Uh, we're going to do it again. We'll do it again when it's a little cooler, okay? <laughs> y'all calm down. Uh, so... Anyway, appreciate y'all y'all being here and, and being so gracious to allow me to go and, and, and preach at another church a couple weeks ago, but um, I, I do appreciate that. Thanks for Pastor Robbie. He's on vacation this week, but he filled in a couple weeks ago for me, and Pastor Mark Stroud from uh, Kingdom Rock came last week or two weeks ago and brought a word for y'all and just tore the place apart like he always does, and, and uh, I appreciate having friends. Honestly, listen, y'all, it is nice for a pastor to be able to have pastor friends who really, really want each other to win and succeed. It's not about competition. 
We don't, we don't win until we all win. We don't win until the kingdom wins. And so I, I appreciate God raising up a bunch of men and women around here who, who believe that and live that. And I'm blessed to be a part. So uh, I don't know if you all noticed this, but school starts this week for most everybody. <clears throat> and I, um, I appreciate you students not booing or hissing or throwing anything. Um, but it's always an exciting year. So I spent, um, I spent 10 years as a public school teacher and administrator. And I, st- I just love the new school year. I just love it. And now this is my third year as a school bus driver. And it, there's just something exciting about, uh, about the beginning of school. It just feels like you get to press reset and start all over again. No matter how terrible last year might have been, this, is, can, this can be your year, right? So you, uh, you just get a chance to reset. So we, every year we like to pray a blessing, a back-to-school blessing over, uh, over our students and over our parents and over our teachers and administrators and support staff, anybody that has anything to do with school. And I love that we've got, we've got principals and we've got uh, nutrition. I don't remember what they, what do y'all, what do y'all get called now? School nutrition people, I don't know, that, that, that cook there in the cafeteria, in the lunchroom. My mama was a lunchroom lady. I don't know what the updated term is, but we've got, we got everybody uh, all kinds of people, and I just love I love the mix that God has blessed us with. So a lot of times I like to invite people to come and, and pray over our kids and our staff and our parents, and, uh, and this year it's a very special treat. So I invited Robin Dockery to come and pray. Robin is the assistant to the superintendent of Harrelson County Schools, and she is our homeless liaison. Uh, y'all know the forms, parents, that you fill out every year, the McKinney-Vento thing that tells you you're not a migrant worker and, and wh- whether or not you're homeless. So all those forms go to Robin's office if you're in Harrelson County Schools, and she's the one that has to process and sort all of that stuff. She has a very, very important job in the lives of our students uh, in Harrelson County, and, uh, and I'm, just, I'm honored to, to have her as a friend and, and a colleague. So, Miss Robin, if you would come and share whatever's on your heart, and then we'll gather the, we'll gather the youngins and, and we'll pray. I don't mind if you don't walk up. Robin just had back surgery, and so uh, she's just going to do whatever it takes to keep you out of pain. Thank you. Good morning. Um, like you said, I'm the homeless liaison for Harrelson County Schools. And I think a lot of times people have an idea of what homeless is, Um, but homeless is not just the guy that's living under the box or under the the bridge in the box on I-20 or at the curve when you pass them. That's not what homeless is. In Harrelson County, we have over 300 students who are homeless, and those kids are usually kids who are, we call them couch surfers. They may be your high school and middle school kids, and they will actually live on a friend's couch. And sometimes they stay there until that friend's family says, you can't stay here anymore. And then they move on to the next couch or somebody's garage. Sometimes they live in their cars. Um, And we have families who are doubled up, where two families live in the same household together. And I have a hard time explaining this a lot of times to families because they come in and they've got things going on, and and I say, well, it's two families living in the same household. Well, we're not two families. This is my grandma and my mama and me and my kids, and we all live together. We're one family. No, you're, you're multiple families living in the same household. So it's two family groups that are living together, and that's considered homeless. Um, and that is most of our families, and I'm telling you, John and I were at a little Facebook thing going last week, it's going to get worse because as rent prices skyrocket and if you've been out there and looked for a place to rent, the rent prices are unbelievable. And people who have rental houses are selling those rental houses because the money's good right now. So they're selling those rental houses and that means there's even more people who are going to need a place to live. So um, we're going to see more and more in that, of that. And there's going to be more and more need Um, with gas prices like they are. We send buses after people who end up in motels and everything else. So um, our kids are out there. Sometimes they're invisible. Sometimes they think if they tell us that they're homeless, that we're going to say, oh, I'm calling defects. 
we don't do that. But we don't do, I don't do that. If they're homeless, my job is to find and meet the needs so that that kid can attend school. Clothing, shoes, uh, school supplies, anything like whatever that kid needs so that they can attend school, that's what we want to do. It goes beyond that a lot of times. And I'll just give you a little bit about myself. I've been running for God, from God for 50 years. It took me a long time to realize about it. It's funny that you said because I wrote down my prayer, my church words. God doesn't care about those. When you said John 9, 23, deny yourself and pick up your cross daily. I throw that thing down more times than not. Sometimes I run out the door and I forget to pick it up. And sometimes I get to work and the whole thing is blown up and I throw it out the door. And sometimes I have to lay on it just to get up. So if you're sitting here thinking that God can't use you, I'm living, breathing proof that God can use you. I never wanted to be a homeless liaison. I didn't even know what that was. But God said, there's a job for you that I want you to do. And this is, I didn't even know where Waco, Georgia was. I drove down 78 about a thousand times, and there was this sign that said Waco, Georgia, one mile. And every time I'd be like, oh, missed it. That none of that was Robin's plan. None of that was Robin's plan. And God said it was his plan that I do these things. And here I am. And I just want to serve him. And he uses me through my weaknesses. And a couple of years ago when I had had surgery, I ended up with sepsis. And I was dying. And I was laying in that hospital thinking... I don't know what it is that you're trying to get me to learn. But I just want to do what you want me to do. And so that's what I'm doing every day. And I do, and I do it poorly. Um, but he gives me a new beginning every single day. So for our kids and for our staff... My, well, let's just pray. Father God, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to serve you and to worship you and to worship with these brother and sisters, Lord. For our children, I ask that you touch our hearts as the adults. I ask you that you show us the need, you give us the patience, the understanding, so that when these kids come to us, we can help them. God, I ask that you prick the hearts of the families, of everyone who's involved, that we remember that we are the light. That we are supposed to be the ones who are showing the kids the way to you. Father, I ask that you use me any way that you want. Father, I ask that you bless each person here, bless each family each child that will be walking through the doors of any school. Lord, I just hope that you will find it in your heart to allow us to be a blessing to the families and to the kids, to the administrators, the lunchroom ladies, the bus drivers, every part of every school system, Lord, just use us as your, your body to make a difference in the lives of those that we work with and that those we will serve. In your precious name, I ask these things. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Robin. <clears throat> Thank you for, for uh, pushing through and coming on this morning. I appreciate you being here. So listen, while we're kind of just handling family business, uh, I'm going to ask Mark uh, Mark Bradley to come on, come on over here if you don't mind, Mark. So. Um, it's been kind of a heavy season at Covenant Life for a while. And I told you a few months ago we had six people with cancer. Uh, Mark's number six. 
So he has a, a malignant tumor in his kidney, and he's going Wednesday, Wednesday for surgery. Um, they don't expect to have to do chemo or radiation. They're planning to go in and take out about 20% of his kidney. The Lord has designed us in such a way that they say you'll probably never notice a difference. So um, fortunately, the Lord is smarter than us, builds in redundancy, and he's going to be fine. So we're just, but, but this is a big deal, right? It's a big deal. They're going to do it laparoscopically. It's crazy. He'll spend a night in the hospital and he'll go home. So uh, we're just going to pray that God just be with him. So if, if the elders and the prayer team and anybody else that wants to come and just surround him, come on, Mark. And, and we just want to pray for him and love on him and, and uh, April and, um, and bless this family. Thank you very much. I think she went to get ready for the luncheon. Y'all come on in. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for um, we thank you for your servant Mark. We thank you, Lord, he's your son. And Lord, we don't ask these things for any other reason other than that just you love him because he's yours. Lord, we're not asking you to give him in return or in in proportion to uh, how important he is or or anything like that. Lord, the fact that he is your son is enough. Lord, we just pray that you would be with him on Wednesday. We pray that you guide the hands of the surgeon, the medical team that attends to him. I pray, Lord, that you would give them skill and wisdom. Lord, that you would, um, that, you would uh, that the surgery would go perfectly. God, that it would go exactly the way they hoped it would go, that it would do exactly what it is intended to accomplish, that his, uh, his recovery would be quick and complete. Lord, that he never have another problem with this uh, again, Lord, that the kidney function would never be an issue. And God, that he'd be able to continue to do the things that you've called him and gifted him to do. Lord, continue to be a blessing to your kingdom the way he's always been. Lord, a blessing to his family. And I just pray that you give him peace, that you give uh, April and Sawyer and, and all of the family and friends peace as he goes in, Lord. And I pray that we just be able to give you the glory and the honor for every blessing through this situation. In the name of Jesus, we just declare that he is healed and made whole. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I love you, buddy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you uh, know anything about covenant life, you, I hope you know three words, real, relational, and reaching. And so we don't believe in coming and putting on the church face, using the pretty church words, Robin. We believe in just being real. And when, something, when something's great, we want to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And when something is, is scary, we want to pray through. And if something is upsetting, then we want to mourn with those who mourn. So... Uh, so pardon us for handling some family business this morning, but starting back to school is a big deal, and having surgery is a big deal, and uh, we don't pray for every stub toe and, and you know everything that, that's going on in everybody's life, but there, y'all understand the threshold, right? So I appreciate you giving me grace to, to be able to do that, because that's, that's what family is about. That's what family's about. Let me tell you about a couple things. We're going to get into the Word this morning. Um, if this is your first time here or if you haven't done it, um, and I haven't been here in the last couple weeks to, to remind you, uh, but if you have not filled out a connection card, I really would appreciate it if you would. They should be in the seat back pockets in front of you. Uh, if this is your first time today, I hope you got a, a gift bag on the way in, and there's a connection card in that. Or if you'd prefer to do it electronically, there's a QR code on your screens. Whether you're here in person or watching online, you should be able to scan that QR code. Take All that goes to the same place, okay? So if you do us the great favor of giving us your name and just some form of contact, I'd like to reach out this week and say thank you for coming, okay? That's all that is. We don't put you on a list. We're not doing anything weird. Nobody going to show up at your house like with cranberry cookies or nothing. We just want to say thanks for coming, okay? So 
Uh, if you'd do that, we'd appreciate it. Uh, men's ministries tonight at 5 uh, here in the main sanctuary. So men, if you, you don't have to be a member of our church, just come on, bring your friends, your neighbors. Uh, you can bring your sons and come on and enjoy fellowship with us tonight. Um, if, you, if there's a few of you that help us clear out the chairs in this section over here after church, we have an event uh, after church that we need to get set up for. So if a few of you would stay and help us, we sure would appreciate it. Um, and Heather and Corey can, will direct traffic over there to help you know what to do, where to go. Um, one, one, more, one more thing. So uh, we live in a crazy world. Have y'all noticed that? Um, and it's ridiculous that we have to talk about things like safety in a church But we have a safety team that has been functioning for the last several years, and they are very well trained, and they are very passionate about keeping us safe. And you you see the guys in the red shirts um, who are on duty to keep us and our kids safe. You don't see the other members of the team who are uh, who are unmarked, plain clothes security team members who are also here to keep us safe. They have protocols in place uh, for any eventuality, and I promise you these guys practice and train and talk about it and discuss it. So we're in good hands, and I appreciate that. One of the things that we'd like to do just to be prepared in the unlikely event that we should ever have something where we'd need to empty out this room in a hurry is they've developed a, an evacuation protocol Starting, I hope next week we'll have them in the seat back pockets. Uh, They'll be color coded and the doors, the exits will also be color coded. So if we should ever have to evacuate quickly, um, it's going to be best if you know where to go. So all you have to do is check the color on the seat back pockets in front of you and then go to the exits that are uh, coordinated to that color. Okay, so you'll see it. It'll be self-explanatory. There'll be a little script on the card. You can pull it out and remind yourself because y'all are church people and y'all, most of y'all sit in the same spot every week because God told you to sit there, right? So um, you can familiarize yourself with your section and uh, should the need arise, we can get out quickly and safely and everybody be all right. I appreciate Ronnie Smith, our head of security. Um, for for all the hard work and all the things that he's done, all the unbelievable things I've asked him to do over the last five or six years that the team has been existing, and I appreciate him and and all of the team for for what they do. So if you see these red shirt guys, uh, tell them thank you. Pat them on the back and appreciate what they do. Um, I hope you've noticed that uh, the demo's done over here, right? We were talking about a few weeks ago, and now it's done, and it looks great. Looks great. So I'm excited about that. Um, so now we get to, we get the fun part starts. Now we're in the planning phase to, uh, to plan a a building, to plan a a kids and student ministry building, uh, because after we get that built, then we'll be able to give the house of Cherith the entire, um, Coley building and really expand what they're able to provide for their ladies. And so we're, we're excited about what the Lord's doing through the Jericho project. And, um, and we just appreciate everything that you're, that you're doing to make that happen. All right? So one last thing, if you'd like to give this morning, if you came with tithes or offerings, uh, if you want to give in person, there are giving boxes at the exits in the back. Uh, you can also give electronically, and there's the, the ways to give are on the screen. However you choose to give, uh, whatever the Lord lays on your heart, we really, really appreciate that because it allows us to do what we do. Hey, if you've got, uh, just remembered, if you've got anything for the Christmas in July project for the kids in the Philippines through uh, Jeff Vaughn and Salt and Light Ministries, if you uh, want to drop those off today, we got to wrap this thing up because it ain't July no more. So we got to wrap them up and get them boxed up and shipped to the Philippines, and they will arrive about a week before Christmas. So um, we need to get that done. If you've got it, please please give it to us today. If you plan to get some like today, then, then schedule that with us so we know when to, when to be here to pick them up, okay? All right, well, let's get into the Word. Y'all grab your Bibles. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 2 Timothy 3. Two places to begin with, 1 Corinthians 10 and then 2 Timothy 3. First Corinthians 10 and verse 11 says this, these things happened. He's talking about the, um, the, the exodus and the, the works and the writings of Moses, the experiences of the children of Israel in the promised land. He said, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us 
who live at the end of the age. The things that they went through happened as examples for us and they were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I hope you've heard this. Uh, if not, this is a very, very important passage in the Word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, All Scripture is inspired. That means God breathed. It's inspired by God and is useful to teach us what's true. And to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. How many of you know the Bible is not here to make you feel better about living in sin? All right? It's to, it's to show us what's true, to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. And then verse 17 it says, God uses it, what? Scripture, to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Lord, I pray that you would add your blessing and your illumination and understanding to the reading and the hearing and the preaching and most importantly, the doing of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd change us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm really excited to start a brand new series today. Um, I've never done one quite like this. Uh, there are th these two scriptures kind of give you the inspiration for it or kind of the big idea behind it. All scripture is inspired by God and it's given to us for a purpose. Not just the scriptures about Jesus, okay? Not just the red letters, but not just the New Testament, but all of it is given to us for a reason. All 66 books, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I know when you read these things, Sometimes it seems like stories. You're like, oh, that's a cool story. Let's read the story of this. They're not stories. They're accounts of actual people who, who, who these are their actual experiences and their interactions with God. So I want you to understand that. The Bible teaches us that those experiences have been, have, were experienced by them and then they were recorded and preserved and transmitted to us to teach us what to do and what not to do to teach us about the Lord and how He wants us to live. We ignore these passages, any of these passages, we ignore these to our peril. We need to hear about Abraham and about Samuel. We need to hear about Elijah and Eli. We need to know about the powerful women of God, Deborah and Jael and the others. We need to know about Moses and Jonah. So today we're going to start a series that I'm calling Patriarchs, prophets and priests, patriarchs, prophets and priests. And, and we're going to sort of dive into these things. I have no idea how long this is going to take. I am not in a hurry. We're just going to dive in, take our time and talk about the major players uh, of the Old Testament, the ones who gave us the foundation of our faith. And we're not only just going to find out the facts of their experiences, uh, but we're also going to talk about the lessons they can teach us. But, but also we're going to be on the lookout for the types and shadows of Jesus Christ. Because I do want you to understand this. This entire book is about Jesus. Amen. All right, It's about Jesus. The Old Testament, the New Testament, everything is about Jesus. Either pointing to Jesus, talking about His life on this earth, or explaining His teachings and, and, and how to live those out. It's all about Jesus. Okay, so today we're going to start in the book of Genesis Genesis chapter 6, if you want to open there, we're going to read several passages there. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to talk about Noah. So today's message title is very cleverly named <coughs> Noah. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 8. But Noah found favor, found grace with the Lord. This is the account of Noah. See, the, the account, not the story. This is the account of of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I've decided to, de to destroy all living creatures, for they fill the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. 
So, here's the instructions. Build a large boat from cypress wood or gopher wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. And then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around, uh, all the way around the boat. That's for ventilation, and he'll need it. You'll see why in a minute. Put the door on the side. Build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, male and female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. (laughs) That's the fine print. All right, Uh, Pairs of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of small animal animal that scurries along the ground, you will, uh, will come to you to be kept alive and be sure to take on board enough food for you and your family and all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Now God was ready to pour out his judgment and his wrath on this earth because of all the corruption and the violence. It was bad uh, and the judgment was justified. But right in the middle of all of that was Noah, a man who had found favor with God because he was righteous and blameless and walked in close fellowship with God. That is significant to me. And I want so that's the here's the first lesson from Noah righteousness is never wasted. Righteousness is never wasted, sin and injustice is never ignored. Righteousness is never wasted. Sin and injustice is never ignored. It's significant to me that he was the only righteous man on the earth, but he got God's attention. In a world dark with sin, the righteousness shone like a beacon. Not just to the people around Noah, but straight up to the throne of God. When God looked down on this dark, sinful earth, he could not ignore Righteous Noah. Listen, I know our world is crazy. And that's a good place to say amen, right? It is absolutely nuts. And sometimes it just seems like too much trouble to even try anymore, right? You're just like, how in the world is anything I'm going to do going to make a difference with all of this craziness? Listen to me. Don't give up. Don't give up. Righteousness is never wasted. It's never wasted. God sees you. God sees you. I want to show you this. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. And he's quoting one of the Old Testament prophets. He says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. He, he, sees, he sees you. He sees your faith in Jesus. He sees you trying to do what's right and how you're staying in close relationship with Him like Noah did. He's right there beside you. There is no no righteous act that will ever go unnoticed. Not one prayer will ever go unheard. Not one moment spent in worship has ever been ignored. Not one tear that you've ever shed has fallen in vain. There's not one verse of Scripture that you've read and meditated on that hasn't been planted deep into the soil of your heart by the Holy Spirit that He can use to encourage you in a time of need. Don't get weary in well-doing. Righteousness is never wasted. It's never wasted. But that verse in 1 Peter is also the perfect pivot to the last part of this point. Not only is righteousness never wasted, but sin and injustice is never ignored. It's never ignored. It's so hard sometimes not to question the character or or the resolve of God in a world that's as ridiculous as this one. Right? You see so many things that happen. This young lady, 18-year-old girl, gunned down in, the, in, in Carrollton this weekend. 
Uh, and, and as a parent, I want, because I've got a 17-year-old, and, and I want to have some teachable moment about, well, see, this is why you should do this, or this is why should that poor girl never, she didn't do a thing wrong. She did nothing wrong. It's a crazy, crazy world that we live in. And, you, and, and it's so easy to wonder, where is God in the midst of all this? Why does this kind of foolishness happen? Why does it seem like the bad guys win and the good guys lose every time? It's, it's hard not to question the character and the nature of God. It's hard not to question His resolve and whether or not He's still here, whether or not He's, he's allowing this, like what's going on. The deists will tell us that God created the world, He spun it into orbit, and then abandoned it to its own devices. He's, he's creator only, and the rest of it is up to us. The humanists will tell us that, that we're on our own to figure out what's right and wrong, that humankind is, is the highest judge of, of moral purity, and, and it's up to us to bring justice to this earth. Atheists will tell you that God never did exist, doesn't exist, never will exist, and, and, and so there's no reason to expect Him to intervene. But from Genesis to Revelation, Scripture reveals a God who is tuned in to what's going on in this world. Nothing gets past Him. He looked at His creation in Noah's day and He said, y'all are a mess that's ridiculous. Noah's the only one getting it right, and I'm starting over with just him and his family. God just refused to look at it anymore. And, and, but don't think that once the flood was over, God was like, okay, there, I fixed it, and, and, just, and just moved on. He, 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 he didn't stop watching. He didn't stop searching. He, he looked at what's going on in this earth, and he watches constantly. The eyes of the Lord are roving the earth Every day, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And history is full of times when God stepped into the muck and the mire of mortal men and brought justice to the innocent and salvation to those who were in trouble. And you can rest assured in those, in those moments when justice isn't found on this earth that there is, there is not one instance of injustice that will be ignored. Every instance of injustice will be made right. Not one sin debt that won't be paid in full. The blood of the innocent ones cry out to the throne of God and He will answer with a vengeance against which there is no defense. The guilty will pay. The violent will reap the whirlwind. They will find out that the widow has a bridegroom and the orphan has a father and He will defend them once and for all. The story of Noah teaches us righteousness is never ignored and sin and injustice is also never ignored. Righteousness is never wasted. Sin and injustice is never ignored. So, Noah got busy building this boat. Longer than a football field. It's a football field and a half. 450 feet. Taller than a four-story building. No power tools, mind you. No Home Depots, right? No, no cranes, nothing. But Noah did everything exactly as the Lord commanded. Now here's just a quick aside. We're going to chase a squirrel. Y'all want to chase a squirrel with me for a second? Any squirrel chasers here in the house? All right. And how long? I, I, I'm going to ask you a question. Do not answer this out loud because as up to, uh, up to this past week, I would have gotten it wrong and embarrassed myself in church. So don't say this out loud. All right. How long did it take Noah, not Moses, okay, Noah, to build the ark? How long did it take him? I've always heard 120 years. Um, did you know the Bible doesn't say that? I didn't know that until this week. 120, 120 years. Nope, that's not what it says. Some say it was 100 years because when Noah was first introduced in chapter 5, it says he was 500 years old. And then when he went into the ark, it says he was 600. So they're saying, oh, well, he must take him 100 years. That's not what it says. It doesn't say how old he was when God called him to build the ark. So we don't know for sure. How about that? We might have been wrong our whole lives. <gasps> might, sometimes we just make stuff up. And blame it on the Lord, right? We, we don't know how long it took. We do know it took a long stinking time. And, and it was not easy, right? 
but, God, but Noah was faithful to do it anyway. Now, part of the reason it wasn't easy is because Noah had nothing but his faith to go on. There, he had never, he's, he, it, it wasn't like God could say, hey, you remember like that boat that this other guy built? I want you to do, they had no, nothing to go on. It was just faith. Nothing like this had ever been done before. Because nothing like this had ever been needed. Noah was a pioneer. He was doing something nobody else had ever done. And that leads us to the next thing that I want us to learn from the account of Noah. Today's obedience prepares you for tomorrow's reality. Today's obedience prepares you for tomorrow's reality. There was no need for a boat when Noah started building it. But I promise you, he was glad he did it when it started to rain. Some of what God uh, tells you to do, leads you to do, will not have an immediate impact, and sometimes it won't even make sense right now. He may be training you for a ministry that doesn't even exist yet. A ministry that isn't even needed yet. Noah had to be obedient in the present in order to be prepared for the future. Now, listen, Noah got the download, right? God gave him the whole deal. He explained it to him. But even when God explains stuff to you, you still don't really get the full grasp of what God's talking about until it unfolds in front of you, right? So most of the time, God don't even tell us because we won't understand it. So if you know what God said, if you know what the next step is, just go do that. Quit worrying about where it's going. Quit worrying about how it's all going to add up. You just don't know. Just take the next right step. If you know God's saying to do it, just go do it, okay? I mean, but, but, but boy, we like us some logical progressions, though, don't we? don't we? Don't we like it when stuff makes sense? Don't we like straight lines? Am I the only one? Am I just the OCD, ADHD, MOUSE, all those things? I like straight lines, man. I like it when what I'm doing today trains me for tomorrow. That I want to know specifically that yesterday made today easier and tomorrow be easier because what I'm doing today. Guess what? Sometimes your obedience is not even training. It's just transportation. Now, y'all don't miss this one. Sometimes it's not training. It's just transportation. There is no evidence that Noah ever stepped foot on another boat or built another boat. As a matter of fact, Genesis 9 and 20 says that Moa, no, Moa, no, Moana, that's him, no, Noah was a man of the soil, not a man of the sea. Dude was a farmer. God called a farmer to build a boat. And when he was done with the boat, he never built another one. God wasn't training him to be a sailor. He wasn't trained because he didn't even sail it. He just got on it and rode the waves until it stopped with all the animals. So he, he wasn't training to be a sailor, wasn't training to be a ship builder. This was his first and only boat. God was just getting him from one side of the flood to the other. See, we're tempted to try to make everything make sense in our lives. We're tempted to look at some of the stages of our life and go, what was that about? Like we get all King James sometime and go, what meaneth this? Like, I don't understand. How did this help me? How am I ever going to use this? It's like algebra, right? How am I ever going to use this? And sometimes God's answer is, it got you to where I wanted you. That's what good it did. So, like, don't overthink everything. Sometimes a boat is just a boat. Sometimes it's just transportation from one point in your life to the other. It gets you from where you are to where God wants you to be. And that's the grace of God, right? That's the grace of God that He cares enough to get you there. He's not just going to call you there. He's going to get you there. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, Noah finishes the boat, opens it up, all the animals show up. Two of everyone that, that were ceremonially unclean, just like the regular old animals, like possums and stuff. And 
Uh, I still got to talk to Noah about why he let the possums on. But the, the, all those, and, and then seven of the clean animals that he could offer as sacrifice to the Lord. And after they got on the boat, Noah loaded his family uh, all the food and supplies that they were going to need, and God shut the door. A week later, it started to rain, and the flood came. So here's the next thing that we can learn from Noah. If you can't see past your present, you won't like your future. If you can't see past your present, you're not going to like your future. And I want to show you what Jesus said about it. Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, it'll be like it was in Noah's day. All right, well, what was Noah's day like? Uh, Verse 38 says, in those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going on until the flood came and swept them all away. That's the way it'll be when the Son of Man comes. That's what Jesus said. These people around uh, around Noah were just doing their thing. Man, they're just living their lives. Eating, drinking, focusing on their lives on earth. They gave no thought for tomorrow, no thought for eternity, no thought for the things of God. This this world is not our home, y'all. This is not all there is. If we live our lives focused entirely on the here and the now, then we'll miss the opportunity to spend eternity there and then with Jesus. I want to show you 1 Corinthians 15. This is what Paul said uh, uh, about our faith. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be pitied more than anybody in the world. If you bought into this gospel that I referred to earlier, this, this uh, genie in a bottle Jesus, this tiger on a, on, on a, on a, on a leash Jesus, this, that, that, this Santa Claus Jesus, that, that everything's about the here and now and making everything great and you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and it's not about saving your sorry soul from sin and putting you on a path to living in eternity with Him. If it's not about following Him every day, then, then we got it wrong. And Paul said, if that's all Christianity does for you, is make your today good, then I feel sorry for you, Paul said. I feel sorry for you. You're worse than the heathens because now you're deceived and you're using God's name in vain. Following Jesus is not about the here and the now. Is He present in your here and now? Of course He is. Are there blessings of God for following Him? Are there, is the Lord's favor for here and now? Certainly it is. But the way of Jesus is about denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. If you can't see eternity, if you can't see the debt of sin that you owed in your life, if you don't recognize that there's a reckoning coming, then you'll never surrender your life to Jesus. Don't worry about storing up treasures on earth. Store up your treasures in heaven. Make your decisions with eternity in mind. You have to see past your present. In Jesus' parable of the rich fool, the man said, I got all all this stuff, man. I got all this stuff. More stuff than I can ever use. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down all my old barns and I'm going to build bigger barns so I can put all my old stuff and my new stuff in there. And the Lord said, God said to him in in this parable, he said, you fool. Listen, when God calls you a fool, you're just a fool. Right? He he said, you fool. Tonight, I'm going to call your soul. Then who's going to get your stuff? You've been so focused on the here and the now that you haven't made preparations for the inevitability of tomorrow. And we got, we got people running around all over, the, all over the country now who are living the same way. You have to see past your present if you want to get to a future that you actually want to live in. The Apostle Paul, for example, he was, he was the man. He was at the top of the social and religious and political pyramid. He was educated. He was respected. He was powerful. He was feared. Most likely he was wealthy. 
And after choosing to follow Jesus, after Jesus called him on the road to Damascus, he was hated and maligned and beaten and broke and hungry and cold, arrested and executed for his faith. But Paul considered himself to be blessed and his suffering to be nothing. How in the world does that make sense? Because he wasn't stuck on today. He wasn't stuck in this world. He was looking at eternity. Listen, following Jesus is not a present-based thing. It's future. It's about the future. Noah had to endure the ridicule of an unbelieving generation and the hard physical labor of building a 450-foot-long boat in order to be obedient and ultimately rescued from the destruction that he knew by faith was coming because God said it. The people of Noah's day saw him building a boat. They were too busy with today to worry about tomorrow. Some of them didn't even ask. See, here's the problem, though, with living for today. Time is marching on. And eventually, tomorrow becomes today. When the rain started to fall, the tomorrow that they had ignored became a today that they didn't expect. But it was too late. It was too late. This is how the account of Noah is a type and shadow of Christ. Jesus, Noah's not the shadow of Jesus. The ark is the shadow of Jesus. Jesus is our ark. He's the only way to be saved. He rescues us from certain destruction. But it's a limited time offer. Right? Once God closed the door to the ark, Noah couldn't have opened it for people if they had changed their mind. He couldn't have opened it if he had wanted to. Once God closes the door, the door is closed. It, people try to negotiate with God like they're equals. Like we're, like, it's not open for discussion. God gets to tell us how this works, and we either do it His way or we don't. It's a limited time offer. His invitation requires a response. The prophet said, today is the day of salvation. Right now is the accepted time. Not tomorrow. Today. One of these days, it's going to be too late. That's the urgency of the gospel. That's, that's the urgency that Jesus told the, great, the, the, the disciples, the Great Commission. He said, go into all the world. Tell everybody. Right, go everywhere. Tell everybody about the gospel right now. We're on the clock. The world and every individual in it. We have to live in a future forward way that drives our obedience today. If you don't see past your present, you're not going to like your future. So the, the floods came. And everything and everybody was swept away from the face of the earth except for the people and the animals that were on the ark. You say, John, wow, like eight? Only eight were saved out of the whole population of the world at that time? Yeah, that's not good odds, is it? That's not, that's not a good percentage. But here's the truth. The lost always outnumber the saved. Amen. For the reasons that we've already stated. People are too hung up in today, in the here and now, in the what's going on in this world, to be thinking about eternity. They just don't see their need for a Savior. Or some people do. They're just too stubborn and too proud and too arrogant to submit to Him. There are some people that when you say this is the only way, they're going to say, I'm finding me another way. Do y'all know people like that? Are y'all people like that sometimes? Like, this is the, this is the best way to go. No, I'm going I'm to go to GPS. I'm going to find me another way. Okay, drive around in circles. I'm just telling you, right? Some people are just too stinking stubborn to, do, to, to listen to and follow the truth. Look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Matthew 7, Jesus said this in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. I promise, Matthew 7, Jesus said something. Oh, there it is, yay. 
I was going to have to chase my glasses. Um, it, you, can, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Did you hear Jesus say that? There's only one way to get there. The highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. There's a bunch of people on that road. But the gateway to life is very narrow. The road is difficult. And there's only a few that ever find it. You're like, what? That don't sound like the Santa Claus Jesus I signed up for. No, it doesn't, does it? This is real Jesus. This is Bible Jesus. And he said, yeah, there's going to be a whole bunch of people lost and only a few saved. My question for you today is, are you going to go with the crowd? Or are you going to be bold enough to be one of the few who enter through the gate of Jesus and find life? Find life. I'm almost done, y'all. But Noah, I've got to get through the flood. We can't leave the man on the boat with all those animals, bless him. So Noah and his seven family members were saved. And after a year on the boat, they were able to come out of the ark onto dry land. And they made a sacrifice of worship, mostly because he just needed to kill one of them animals, right? So, okay, did a, I'm just kidding, y'all, I'm sorry. He, he made a sacrifice of worship and gratitude to the Lord. Listen, I think it really hits a person when you walk off the, you walk off the boat and there is nobody left on earth. I think it kind of hits you how great a salvation you've been offered, Right? So he came off and he made this sacrifice of gratitude to the Lord. And, and, and God was well pleased with his faithfulness and with his courage to endure the hardship. And he told Noah he's going to place a rainbow in the sky as a reminder that he committed to never destroying the earth with floodwaters again. I want to show it to you in, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 17. God said to Noah, yes, the ra- this rainbow is the sign of the covenant that I'm confirming with all the creatures on the earth. So that's what the, that's what the rainbow is for. It's a reminder of the covenant of God. So Noah and his family started over again with God at the center of everything. And, and they were enjoying his blessings and they were being fruitful and multiplying and they were doing all the things. But, but I, I reminded you of this scripture last week if you, were, if you were there, but it applies here as well. Be careful when you think you stand because you're in the prime position to fall. Why is that? Pride. Pride is always knocking at the door, and that's what got Noah into trouble. So I want to read you one more passage from Genesis 9, 20 and 21. After the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground. Why? Because he's a farmer. It's what he does. And he planted a vineyard. And one day, he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked in his tent. Now, there, there's more to the, you can read the rest of the story if you want to, and there's a whole lot of speculation about what actually happened to Noah that night. Um, but but this, this is enough for our, for our last point. Um, don't get intoxicated with the taste of your own accomplishments. Don't get intoxicated with the taste of your own accomplishments. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the fruits of your labor. You work hard. It's okay to enjoy the, the fruits of that. It's healthy even. It sustains you. It motivates you to go back and keep working. The problem with the sweet taste of the wine for Noah that Noah had made, he had planted this vineyard, now he's enjoying the fruits of it. The problem is that he lingered too long with it. He enjoyed it too much. The glass was good, but he wanted the whole flask. The fruit of success should be a pivot point. It, you should enjoy it as you look back with gratitude and satisfaction at a job well done. It, do y'all ever do this when you cut the grass? I go, look at my, I go sit on my porch and look at my grass. I eyeball all of it. That's right, I cut you down. Next week I'm going to cut you again. Right? It, it's motivating for me to smell it and know I conquered it. It's good. Now, if I went and rolled around in it, that's weird. That's too much. Now, John, that was too much. Right? That's what Noah, Noah looks at. He enjoys the fruit of the vine. He's like, yep, this was good. The problem was he wouldn't let it go. 
He kept on convincing himself at how good he was at his job. It's good to look back, but it has to be with gratitude and satisfaction at the job well done. Gratitude for the grace of God to allow you to do it. Then, then you turn around and you look with anticipation and obedience at what God's still got in front of you. The success should motivate you to turn around and get back to work. You get stuck too long in the accomplishment and you start to believe more in your own greatness than in God's greatness. And that's a dangerous place to be. Pride will lead you down a road uh, that you don't want to go down. Because every road leads to a destination. The book of James says, God gives grace to the humble, but He opposes the proud. The, the humility that got you to where you are can very quickly get replaced by pride and the opposition of God against any future progress. So we have, to, we have to be careful in how we respond even to our own success. Now, fortunately, Noah's self-centeredness, his pride seems to have only lasted for the evening, though that was enough trouble that it caused in his life. It, but if you get stuck admiring your own greatness for too long, not only do you delay your future obedience, you might even, depending on how you handle it and how long you stay, you might even disqualify yourself from what God had for you in the future. So don't fall into the trap. Take a sip of satisfaction, then get back to work with what the Lord's called you to do. Because ultimately, all the glory belongs to Him. And you don't ever want to try to get in the way of God and His glory. And listen, there are a lot of things to learn from these three chapters in Genesis about Noah. A lot more than we had time to go into. Here's the most important one, and I want to make sure I point it out. Jesus is the ark that rescues you from the wrath of God. Because here's what the Bible says, none of us is righteous. Not even one. Each one of us owes a debt for sin that we can't pay on our own. But God sent Jesus, His only Son, to make a way for us, to die on the cross, to take the penalty for our sins so that we could go free, so that we wouldn't have to face the wrath of God. And not only that, He brings us into the family with Him so that we can enjoy the love and the fellowship with God. Um, that our soul craves. More than anything else today, if you don't remember anything else, make sure that you hear that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Make sure that before you walk out of this place today that you have repented of your sin, that you've surrendered your life to Jesus, that you are committed. We've said this is the fourth time we've said it, me and Robin both, to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Y'all stand with me, please. So they're going to they're gonna sing a song. We're going to pray, and, and, and then we'll be dismissed in just a minute. But it's important not just to hear the Word. The way that you become a doer of the Word is by understanding it and putting it into practice. So I want you today, I want, I want you to invite the Holy Spirit, and I'm inviting Him now in, into this service to search your heart. To see if you've actually repented of your sin. So many times we have, we have shamed and guilted and manipulated crowds of people into praying a prayer they didn't understand and didn't mean and didn't know anything about. And so we people, too many people think they're saved when they never actually repented of their sin. They never actually surrendered themselves to Jesus. And I just, I want you before you leave today to search your heart and ask the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. If you've never repented, today is the day that you can come to Him humbly and ask for His forgiveness. Repent of your sin and commit to living for Him. If you've done that and you've truly repented, but you, you find yourself wandering back in sin too much, then repent of that sin. He is still faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will be with you and help you to live a life that pleases Him and that becomes more and more like Him as the days and the years go on. 
And once you get those important things handled, if there's any situation you've got going on in your life, life is hard and life is complicated sometimes. If there's anything else you need prayer for, whether it's a need in your body, whether it's a financial need, a relationship thing, a family thing that's going on, big decision you got going on, whatever it is, you feel free to come and pray. We're going to sing and be dismissed together in just a minute. But let's spend some time responding to the Word of God today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would draw people to this altar today. Draw people into repentance. And we, we know that your Word says in Romans that it's your love that draws us to repentance. You're not mad at us. You love us. And I pray, God, that we take it as such and we come and we come humbly before you and we repent of our sin. Lord, I pray that every person in this place today would be saved before they leave. I pray, Lord, that every prodigal, every wandering soul, Lord, would come and and would recommit themselves to you today. And Lord, whatever other need may be in our family, in, in our congregation today, I pray that you draw people to this altar, Lord, and meet them here. And we know that you are faithful to do that, to meet every need and to hear every prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him, I free give. And I will ever love and trust Him in His presence.
pray that you hear that not just as worship, but as a prayer. Lord, we surrender every area of our lives. We unlock all the doors, open all the windows of our lives, Lord, and we invite you to permeate the atmosphere, every part of our lives. Lord, bring healing, cleansing, to forgiveness and restoration and everything. Lord, we thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a great week. If you need something, give us a call, okay?